Hey there, Nick Chitakis here. In this video, we're gonna use git bisect to help find which commit broke something. This helps automate the process of doing a manual bisection search, aka binary search, which helps quickly find one item in a list of items. So this video is gonna be kind of broken up into two parts, where the first part, we're gonna kind of cover what a binary search is through some examples. And then the second half, we're gonna actually jump into a terminal and do some live coding to see how git bisect works. So yeah, before we start here, let's quickly cover an example of when you might wanna use binary search. And by the way, binary search and bisect and search basically mean the same thing here. And if you're already familiar with this concept, yeah, feel free to skip around in the videos there. I always put in timestamps. Um, but yeah, a common example used to be finding a name in a phone book, but yeah, who kind of uses phone books nowadays? Yeah, not so much, right? So instead, let's go over a different example here, which will be a number guessing game. So imagine you picked a random number between one and 100 and asked me to guess what number you picked. You know, it would be pretty tedious, right? If I just guessed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, etc., all the way up until 100. Now, you know, if you picked one as your uh, random number there, then that's pretty efficient. But what if you picked 87? You now I'm gonna have to guess 87 times to find that, and that's not good. But if you had a thousand numbers, right? Uh, clearly that is not a very efficient algorithm to pick something like that. Now, with bisection searching over 100 items, uh, on average, it's going to take about six picks to guess the number there. And you can actually do log two of 100 there, you get 6.64, which you can round down down to six here. And actually this site here lets you do some calculations. For example, you know, we can pop in something like 50,000 and we can see that uh, it takes on average about 15 guesses there to do that. And if, even if we put in something like a million, uh, that is going to be around 19 guesses to do that. And that's basically what this says here. But that really shows, you know, how powerful this method is to find something. That's why that phone book example used to be really popular, right? In a big city there, you could have technically a million names in a book. And if you're trying to find someone in the list there and you use bisection search, yeah, it takes on average about 19 guesses. Now, average is an average there. It's not guaranteed. You could get it sooner, a little bit later there. But on average, that's about it. And you can see, yeah, that's quite nice here. You know, 100 items, six guesses, a million items, 19. It's very approachable here. But uh, yeah, the TLDR on how it works basically is you can half your sample size on each guess if you guess the middle point. For example, if I asked you to pick a number between one and five and you pick three, and I said it's higher, then we know for certain that it's gonna be four or five, right? You don't even need to think about picking one or two, and we already know it's not three there because that wasn't the guess there. So we've already halved our results there. Now, imagine if you had a, a million items to search through, right? If you took the middle point on each guess, it only takes uh, seven moves here to reduce one million items down to about 7,800, right? Yeah, 500K, 250, 125, blah, 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 blah. You know, seven moves later, you're down to about 7,800 here. So that helps, uh, hopefully that gives you the gist on how it works here. But yeah, here's a, a practical example step by step on how it works for a number guessing game here. So, you know, the rules in, in this game would be like, let's say that you're thinking of a number between one and hundred. And again, I need to guess uh, that using bisects and search. And if I were to guess too high, then just let me know it's too high. Likewise, if I guess too low, then let me know it's too low. Now, obviously we're not chatting in real time here, so I'm gonna go over the results of a game that already took place and, you know, humor me here for a second here, and just imagine this took place in an alternate dimension. You and I were doing this guessing game together. So step one, by the way, spoiler alert, uh, you're thinking of number 63 here. So I'm gonna make a guess here, like, is your number 29? Like, no, you're gonna tell me it's higher, right? Because it's 63. And this is where bisects and search comes into play. We know the number is not 29 because, you know, that wasn't the guess there, you know, it wasn't the correct guess there. And it's not gonna be 28, 27, 26, or anything lower than that because you told me it's higher. Great, so that means uh, numbers one through 29 can be completely thrown out. We don't have to think about them ever again. We've basically eliminated just about a third of our choices in one step, right? The, the actual number that you're guessing of must be between 30 and 100. Now, if I wanted to be the most efficient here, you know, I would choose 50, which is the middle point between one and 100, right? And basically keep repeating the middle point, middle point, middle point. But yeah, for the sake of this example here, um, you know, I'm just like semi-randomly guessing here just to see, show how it works here, even when you can't for, or even when you can't perfectly account for something to be calculated exactly in the middle. Okay, is your number 99? Uh, yeah, okay, cool. We already potentially know our lowest pick here is 30 and we've just eliminated 99 and 100 here because you mentioned here that it's lower. So our new range now is 30, which we knew before, and uh, it's up to 98. Uh, that didn't really help us a whole lot here since we only removed 99 and 100, two choices there. It's better than nothing. Of course, this was a wildly inefficient guess here if we, you know, we're doing an optimized by section search. But yeah, let's go to uh, step three here. And uh, is your number 58? No, it's higher, right? And if you go back to here, uh, just as a reminder, you picked 63 here. Um, but like step one, you know, we can take a decent chunk out here. You know, our new range is going to be 59 
to 98 here, right? Because uh, it is a number that's higher than 58. So we know it's not 58. You know, it could be 59 all the way up to 98, which is, you know, we calculated that before. All right, and now we basically just keep repeating very similar steps here, right? Is your number 71? No, it's uh, lower. Okay, we're getting closer, right? Our new range is now 59 to 70 because, you know, it wasn't 71. It's lower than that. So our new range is this, which is basically, you know, one in 12 chance of guessing that one. So let's just guess uh, 64. Nope, it's lower. Okay, cool. So now we've reduced it down to 59 to 63. Basically have a 20% chance, one in five chance of getting that one. And uh, yeah, on the sixth step here, you know, I just took a guess at 63. And yes, that's uh, the answer there. And I realized I need to use uh, colons here, not commas, whatever, I'll fix that in the blog post. But yeah, looks like I got lucky there, right? Hit my 20% shot here and I guessed it. But if I didn't, then we would just basically continue onwards doing the same exact thing until we found uh, the number that you were guessing. And uh, yeah, hopefully this demonstrates how it works at a super basic level. So now you might be wondering, how does this apply to get commits, right? We've seen how it works with sorted numbers and hinted how it could work to find sorted names in a phone book. But yeah, how does this apply to get commits? So, you know, let's say that you have a project that you're working on and the head or the latest commit here has an area of your site that's not working anymore. You know, all you know is about a week ago, this area of your site was working. So in between a week ago and now, you've made 30 commits or 100 commits, you know, whatever, however busy that project is here, but you have no idea which one of those commits caused the problem. And this is a great spot to use by section search, right? We can jump to the 15th commit and see if that works. And uh, if it does work, I realized uh, that shouldn't say doesn't, but whatever, you know, if it does work, then we know the 16th to 30th commit uh, has the problem. We don't know which one it is, but we've just halved our commits to look through, right? We don't need to bother looking at, you know, commit one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 15, um, because we know 15 works, so it must be somewhere in that range. And uh, this actually came up for me quite recently here, and I did some debugging and troubleshooting using Git Bisect to help identify what the problem was. So yeah, this recently came up for some client work where someone asked me to help them troubleshoot why why the Rails app was no longer allowing them to sign in, but the app was not throwing any errors or warnings in the logs when they were trying to sign in. You know, it was a pretty big app. I've never seen it or worked with it before. Uh, I just started asking though, when was the last known good state? And uh, after a little bit of thinking, yeah, he said about a week ago. So we checked out a commit from about a week ago and yeah, the application was working. We were able to log in successfully there. So from there, we used Git Bisect to identify the commit that caused the problem in only a few steps. So many, many, many thousands of lines of code and hundreds of commits there. You know, I'm brand new to the project. We can't go through everything line by line here. And it was a pretty obscure bug there. Um, but yeah, we narrow things down to one line of code in one commit about 20 minutes later in a couple of steps here. So yeah, let's actually jump to the command line here and do a Git Bisect here and see how everything works. So I've got this little uh, demo script here, which is going to set up a dummy repo with 30 files, and each file of the is gonna to belong to its own commit here. So yeah, let me just go here. You know, we're not gonna be looking at this, but uh, we have this git bisect directory that I have set up here. And right now, uh, I actually should probably kill every file here. So let's just do that, uh, except for the demo file. So in this case, what I'll just do is, uh, we'll just do rm on files one through 30 is what I have here. And now if we take a, an LS here, we can just see that we have the demo script, which is going to produce our Git repo from scratch here. But yeah, that's basically where we wanted to go there. So if you actually do want to follow along, just going back to this blog post here, you know, you can copy paste this into a little demo script, whatever you want to name it, and then run it. So let's actually go here. We'll take a very quick peek here at the demo script. Um, and then I will run it in the terminal below here. But yeah, in this case, you know, we're just doing a git init, make a new git repo, and then we're gonna make a sequence here, basically doing a range from one to 30. What are we gonna do? We are going to create a new file. We're gonna add that file to git and then commit it with a message like that. Cool, okay, so let's do that. Uh, now it's gonna just run through here and add these files here. You know, it's gonna take a couple of seconds, whatever you can see, it's already on 20. Uh, we'll just wait until it hits 30. Nice, okay, cool. And uh, yeah, if we do a git log here, we can see that we have uh, these commits here as well. And uh, yeah, I could probably get rid of the script here. It's not super important to go over anymore uh, because now we just want to take a look here and run some um, bisect commands here. But not, in fact, actually there is a, a nicer way we can do this one. So what is this like pretty? I think it's like one line was from the blog post, whatever it was. But yeah, this gives us a whole list of all the different commits here, starting from the bottom, all the way up to the top. And of course, you know, when you run this, then these shots are going to be different. So you'll need to adjust those commands if you're following along on your end here. Yeah, the idea here is let's say that, uh, you know, at the very top here, at, you know, basically commit number 30, let's just call it that. This is where things are broken. And you know for sure, all the way at the bottom here, this first commit, things are working. So somewhere in between here, we have the commit that's actually breaking things, and we don't know what that is. So here is where we can use git bisect to help us get the answer of that. So we can just do a git bisect and then we can start. We need to basically tell uh, the get client that we are going to start doing the bisects and search. 
But now it's gonna ask us to basically supply uh, a couple of different things here. Like we need to give it the bad commit. What is the bad one? And then what is a good one? So what we could do here is uh, actually, let me split this again, just so I can do uh, another get lag pretty just so we can take a look at some commit shots because we're gonna have to paste them in here. Um, but yeah, we can say this is the bad commit here. Technically, you know, we could also just use head here instead, or we can technically not even add the argument here because it's already the master or main branch here checked out. But in this case, you know, let's just pop it in. We'll say that's the bad commit and we'll do a get bisect and we'll say, what's the good commit? Well, you we know, the good commit here is near the bottom. Uh, so I'm just gonna grab this shot here. Nice. And then we can do that. Whoop, I think uh, Tmux Yang didn't, uh, populate my clipboard there. But yeah, in any case here, uh, let's also shrink this one. Maybe I'll keep it around just for later. But yeah, let's focus on the top for now. But now that get bisect understands that we have a bad commit and a good commit, then it is gonna start doing that bisection search for us. Now, remember we had about 30 different commits here, right? And it is going to just go to the middle there and even let us know that there's roughly four steps that we're gonna have to take before we find that bad commit here. But uh, yeah, if you take a look here now and do a get log up top, then it is going to be pointing to that, you know, C3FD commit here. Now, this project is a, a throwaway example. There's no like actual test suite or something to test, but you know, at this in this case though, if this were your real application, you would run your application's test suite or you would do whatever manual steps that you need to see if things are actually working or not. And uh, you know, let's just say in this case that, uh, yeah, you know what, things are working. So what we could do now is just run git bisect and we can just do good. And in this case, we're not gonna put in any argument. This is an autocomplete gray text here. You know, I'm not actually adding that in here. And we can say, yeah, you know what? Get bisect, this commit is looking pretty good. Uh, our tests are passing, let's say. Nice, okay, cool. So now it's gonna go ahead and do uh, another bisection search here, cutting things in half, right? We know that it's somewhere in between commit 16 and 30, right? If we go back down to, uh, well, again, I can't run it again to show all 30 because uh, you know, we're checked out to a different thing here. But yeah, it, it's basically there. And now it's just cutting that in half and it's going to 22 because that's in between um, 16 and 30 in that case. Now you can tell, get again, like, I don't know, I don't know, you run your test suite, did things work? Yeah, it did work again, cool. All right, let's do it again. So now we're at uh, file 26 here or get commit 26. And it's saying basically we're gonna have our answer in roughly two steps here, depending on what happens here. But yeah, let's say in this case, like, no, you know what? Wow, we actually found a bad commit you know, this 78.8F or whatever, my tests are failing and this is where the thing is breaking. So we can tell, get bisect like, look, that's the bad one here. So now it's checking out commit 24 here. So we really only have uh, one more revision left to test after this one here, right? Because it's either gonna be uh, 24 or 25. That is uh, where the problem is. It could either be this one, you know, you can do your tests here and determine if it is that, or if not, then, you know, it's the other one. So we can just say, uh, maybe this one is good here. And then, uh, you know, now it's showing us the actual commit here, which is 25. And again, there are zero steps left, meaning that this is actually going to be the one uh, that is going to be the problem commit here. And if we actually say that, you know what, like, you know, this is uh, the bad commit here or whatever, then it's gonna be like, yeah, this is the first bad commit here and there's our commit. And now what you could do is you can just look, you know, at this actual commit here and uh, see the details. Now, in this case, I'm literally just adding a file and not doing anything there, but hopefully uh, in your case, you have a good commit message with maybe a small amount of files being modified or whatever it happens to be. You could be like, oh, well, yep, duh, it looks like in this application controller, like there's this one line here causing a problem or you know whatever it is for your application and you can go in there and solve it. And then, uh, yeah, you can just you know fix that and then you're good to go here. Um, if you don't have any good commit messages in your project, well, then maybe you should start using some uh, Git Interactive Rebase. I've done videos about that one in the past if you wanna check it out. But yeah, this is a very quick primer on identifying where a bad commit is so that you can just see the last working state of your application, know what went wrong, so then you can actually go up to uh, your latest commit here. You know, you can just check out you know, the master branch or whatever it is, apply whatever uh, changes you need to make there in it, and then you are good to go here. Hopefully that helps. But yeah, if you have any questions about this, let me know in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them. And uh, if you like the video, please give a thumbs up because it really does help a lot. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.